hospital or the new park? 439. Okay, I think I've been announcing 429. Okay, 439 uh, in the old part of Community Hospital is where Brother David uh, Tucker is. So if you have the opportunity to go see him, that I'm sure it would lift his spirits. <clears throat> I can't tell you how excited I am to present this lesson this evening. And the reason why I'm so excited about it is because I changed the theme of this lesson three times. <laughs> and it was all from the same passage of scripture from 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7. And I'd just like to make this comment, and that is when you look deeply into God's word, you are going to find nuggets of gold of wisdom that uh, will just absolutely astound you. And one of the great privileges and blessings of being a preacher is that as I prepare for a sermon, I try to look deep within a passage of, of Scripture to see what I can mine in that wonderful, wonderful Word of God. I first was going to present the lesson concerning the living hope. And that's actually the theme of the first, uh, first epistle of Peter is that we, uh, as God's children, have a living hope. But as I continue to read, as I continue to dig deeper, as I continue to pay more and more attention to those first seven verses, I decided, no, I think I'll preach a sermon on the proof of your faith because that's in there too. And I began to... <clears throat> write that down and look at that and as I continue to investigate those just those seven verses looking at the idea of the proof of your faith I came across something that I had never noticed before and something that really got me excited and so this evening I want to speak to you concerning how everybody's happy it's there in that, in that passage of scripture. It might not be evident to you at first, but when you dig deeply, when you look carefully at those first seven verses of scripture, what Peter, or at least one of the things that Peter brings to our attention is that everybody's happy. And I want us to begin by talking about how that in that passage of scripture we see that God is happy. We see that in verse 3 where we read, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And at first when I read that, I thought, blessed, that word blessed. Well, that's, that's like the word blessed over in Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes uh, that, that Jesus presented in the Sermon on the, on the Mountain. You know, blessed is the pure in heart, for they shall see God, that kind of blessed. And that word blessed there in Matthew chapter 5 literally means happy. And so that's what I was going to put, but I thought, you know what, Bill, you better make sure because the Hebrew language that, or <clears throat> Greek language that God used for the New Testament is very, very specific. And this might not be the same word. And so I looked and sure enough, it wasn't. This word doesn't mean happy per se. It really does in a kind of roundabout way, but this blessed means well spoken of. And I thought about that, and I thought how, well, truly, really, that would indicate that God is happy. You know, when you are standing and you hear a third person talking to someone else, and they're talking about you, and they talk about how wonderful you are, when they talk about how that you do so many good deeds, and they talk about uh, how that you are such a trusted friend and, and a rock of faith, how does that make you feel? It makes you feel happy. When someone speaks well of you, the only result that can come from that is for us to be happy. And so I look at that passage of scripture and I wonder how many of us attach a smiley face when we think about God. 
Anytime that you think about God, do you ever attach a smiley face to that, to that image? Well, I saw this one, I got this one, I chose this one particularly because of the two words there, very good, because it reminded me that when you go back to Genesis chapter 1 concerning God's creation, that when he finished his creation, he looked upon his creation and he pronounced it to be very good. And since it was everything exactly like he wanted it to be, I conclude that when we read about God saying this is very good, that we're talking about God being happy. He was happy with his creation. I think that we read here about God being happy about other things as well. And when you combine that with the, first, uh, with the second verse, you're going to see what makes God happy as you investigate those those two verses and the following verses after that first first Peter chapter 1 verses 2 through 5 particularly you're going to see things there that causes God to be happy first of all I believe that God is happy according to his great mercy we're told has caused us to be born again to a living hope you know why I think that makes God happy because what that is saying is that we are born again, that we are changed. You know, I think that we really shortchange ourselves when we think about what happens when somebody comes forward to be baptized. What exactly is taking place there? We're talking about someone who is a sinner. Sometimes it might be someone who has lived a terrible, terrible life. And then yet they are born again. What does that mean? It means that God has changed that person's heart. In order for you to be born again, your heart has to be changed. You have to be changed from thinking like a sinner. Now you want to think as a child of God. And you want to be guided by the word of God. And you want to do everything according to the will of God. We are changed, brethren, when we obey the gospel. Anybody who obeys the gospel has been changed. Years ago, years ago Jeffrey Dahmer was finally arrested, tried, convicted, and thrown in prison. Convicted of multiple murders. But he just didn't kill people. He cut them up and, and put some of their organs, their body organs into a, a freezer. And every now and then he'd get, a, he'd get one of those body organs out and he'd eat it. You know what that makes him? It makes him a cannibal. It made him a cannibal. And yet we, read, we know how that a preacher up in Wisconsin met with him in prison and after a while, Jeffrey Dahmer was baptized. It disturbs me when I hear people say when they learn about him being baptized, well, yeah, maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. But brethren, I fully believe because Jesus himself said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I have no right to question what took place there. But I tell you one thing, I place a lot of emphasis on Jeffrey Dahmer obeying the gospel. And you know why? Because when somebody obeys the gospel, they become a saint. They become a saint. And I look at my own life and I look at the sins that I committed in my life and the, and the sins that I needed God to forgive me of when I obeyed the gospel. I look at my own life and the change that God has made in my life. I look at Saul of Tarsus who persecuted the church even unto death. And yet God changed his heart. And he became a believer in Jesus Christ and a, and a preacher of the gospel. Peter denied Jesus three times and yet his heart was changed by God. And he was one of his great, great servants and disciples. We need to understand and appreciate what it means, brethren, when we obey the gospel and we become a saint. We're lifted up by God's grace. 
We're above the world. We're above the muck and the mire and the sin and the filth of this world. And we are sanctified and we're set apart and we become saints. And the world doesn't have a clue what a saint is. But you and I are saints. We've been cleansed. And we are above the world. We sing the song sometimes, Higher Ground. And by the way, uh, every song that we have sung tonight, I requested from Tom. And I think that if you'll pay close attention, you'll notice that basically speaking, you sang my sermon tonight. Because a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about were found in those songs that we sang. God is happy because he takes mankind created in his image who in the Garden of Eden was exactly like him in every regard. Adam and Eve were exactly like God other than the physical part of it. But even that, they had a soul, a spiritual part. And they were a joy to God. He had fellowship with them. We're told that he walked with them in the garden and they conversed and they talked with one another and God was so happy and then there was that fall from God's grace, from God's love because of their sin. And ever since then, God has had to work just extremely hard so many times to cleanse us, to wash us, to change us from a sinner to a saint. And when that takes place, God rejoices. I know that that is true from the parable of the, uh, of the prodigal son because the father in that parable uh, represents God. And look at the joy that he had. He said, let's have a feast. One of the things that makes God happy is changing sinners into saints. Look at the person next to you. Because most than likely, the person next to you is a saint. Has been changed. You might not have been like Jeffrey Dahmer. You might not have been a great, great, great sinner like Paul Saul of Tarsus. You might not have been as bad and lived as terrible a life as Bill White did before he had obeyed the gospel. But the person next to you was changed. And they're different than what they were before they obeyed the gospel. And now they are a saint that has been sanctified and set apart. And that pleases God. It makes him happy. It makes God happy when he sees his eternal plan for the salvation of humanity carried out successfully. Could you describe that for me? Would you describe, how would you go about to describe God's eternal plan for the salvation of humanity being carried out, bringing God joy. Let me try. In eternity, even before God created us, he turns to Jesus and says, Son, wasn't known by Jesus at that time, of course, but he says, Son, we're going to create humanity. We're going to create them in our image. They're going to make bad choices. They're going to sin. They're going to separate themselves from us. And the only way that we can get them back is for you to go down to earth, become a human being, live a life of perfection, give up the glory of heaven, give up your equality with me, humble yourself, be rejected and hated by your own Jewish brethren and finally put on a cross, nailed to a cross and die for the sin of the world. And by the way, you're going to, as a human being, you're going to have to live a life of perfection. I'd like for you to turn to Hebrews chapter 5 and look at verse 8 with me. I didn't put it on the screen purposely because I wanted everybody to look at it from your own Bible. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8. It's a passage of scripture that we many, many, many times really don't, don't look at clearly near, near enough to really appreciate it. In Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9, although he was a son, he learned 
obedience from the things that he suffered. Notice that he learned obedience just like you and I have to learn obedience. It wasn't that, well, yeah, he's a human being, but he had, you know, he is God also. Yes, he was God also, but he had a distinction there. While he was here upon this earth, he was a human being, just exactly like you and I, because the scriptures say he was. And it says that he learned his obedience, just like you and I do, by the things that he suffered and having been made perfect. Wait a minute, wasn't he perfect? Well, as God he was. But when he came down to this earth, he was born a baby. He was perfect, just like you and I. When we were born babies, perfect. But he had to stay that way. He had to stay that way all the way through childhood, all the way through those terrible, terrible teen years into early adulthood, into middle adulthood to the point to where he had to remain sin free. Otherwise, he couldn't go to the cross. And yet that's another thing that God told him in eternity. And by the way, when you go down there and you live that life of perfection, what that's going to end in is they're going to nail you on the cross. I'm going to place the entire sin of the world. You're going to become sin. I'm going to have to turn away because I cannot fellowship sin. You're going to suffer that, fel that sever uh, severance of our fellowship. You're going to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But you have to do all of that. You have to be successful in all of that in order for you to pay the price so that I'm satisfied and mankind can be saved. That was Jesus' part. The Holy Spirit has a part too in that he has to reveal all of that to us and we'll amplify on that in just a moment. But God, when he sees that plan that involved some of the most incredible things that had to be done in order for that plan to be realized and, and it come about in an acceptable way. Have you, ever, have you ever planned an extensive vacation? You're, you're, you're going to go through several states. You're going to visit various things. You're going to go, oh, man, that's really nice. This that's, a, that's truly amazing. All oh, over here, this is really, really fun. And you've got it all planned out right down to when you're going to arrive and when you're going to leave and when you're going to arrive at the next place. And it all comes about just exactly like you planned. And it makes you really, really happy because you can look back on your vacation and it was exactly what you wanted. It's exactly what you dreamed about. Think about God in eternity and this incredible plan that he came up with for the salvation of man. And he did it. His son Jesus came down, giving up his equality, humbled himself, even to the point of death on the cross, and paid the price for the sin of the world. That makes God happy, knowing that that plan has been fulfilled. And that he can make us saints because Jesus worked the plan perfectly. God is happy because of the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, before he was ascended into the heavens, told his apostles, he says, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation." And he tells them that, he says, I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And then I want you to teach them to teach others, basically is what that, what that passage of Scripture says. The Holy Spirit was commissioned by God. The third part of the Godhead, the third part of the Godhead was commissioned by God. And he said, you're going to have to do your part in that you're going to have to reveal a written word to mankind. Because you see, those apostles that Jesus sent out, they went 
all over the world. And the Apostle Paul said before he died that, uh, that the gospel had been taken to the whole world. That's great. But what about 2,000 years later? The Holy Spirit through God was to deliver a word that was going to guide men in what it means to be a, a, a Christian so that 2,000 years later, Bill White and Dale Beauvais and Brenda Wigsmone and Karen Her and a whole group of us who are, who are God's children, we are still telling people how that Jesus died for their sins. And that makes God happy because that was a part of that eternal plan. God's happy. He's happy when he looks at us. And it's very, very important for us to live our lives in such a way that we can continue to put a smile on God's face. But let's wonder about this. What makes you and me happy? When you look there in those first seven verses it tells us what makes us happy, or at least should make us happy. First of all, our joy begins with the knowledge of God's mercy. That's amazing grace. That's, that's the song, Amazing Grace. We sang about being a wretched sinner. And we sang about how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. It's my favorite song. It's my favorite song. And as I got to thinking about that and got to thinking about this lesson this evening as I sat there, I just broke down. I missed singing two verses because I was crying. I just couldn't, couldn't get myself back to where I could sing. I remember, I remember when Gene and I, after, after we got married, we made it a rule that every night we would not go to sleep until we had spent time reading and discussing God's word and we were in the gospel of John and all of a sudden I just sat up like I spring loaded and the words that came out of my mouth was I'm not saved I'm not saved at that moment I realized I was a sinner and that I, because I was a sinner I was headed to hell just as fast as I could go and I realized that at that moment God's saving grace was available to me that he loved me so much that Jesus died for me according to God's eternal plan and that I could be baptized into Christ and his blood could wash away my sins and cleanse my soul of all the sin that I was guilty of and I could be a new creation in Christ because of God's great mercy and how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed and how wonderful it is that we are saved by the mercy, by the grace of God, because that mercy, that grace, is something that God gives us even though we don't deserve it at all. We're happy because we will receive an inheritance. <laughs> I like to tell this story because I think it's amusing. Maybe you won't find it so amusing, but Amber and Meredith and I kid each other a lot. One of the things that I like to kid them about is that my brother, sister, and I are joint heirs to 80 acres of farmland down in Texas, which means that when I want to, I can just take my 26 plus acres. It comes out to about 26.6 acres for me. And if I wanted to, I could sell it. Amber and Meredith are my heirs, <laughs> each getting 13.2 acres. And I kid them sometimes when uh, they're kind of, we're having a good time and they get kind of sassy and I say, be careful. Be careful. Because you might miss out on that 13 acres of dirt and weeds. Well, if I sell it as farmland, if they do inherit their 13.2 acres, if they sell it as farmland at the present rate, they each would receive $46,550 as farmland. But if somebody wants to build an industrial complex on those 13.2 acres, 
it goes from $46,550 to $63,264,801 apiece. Now, they get really excited about that. They tell me while we're joking around, now, Daddy, we're not wishing that you're going to die or anything, but, you know. <laughs> but the problem is that lousy, stinking, two-letter word that just messes up everything. If somebody decides to build an industrial complex on their land then they'll receive that. But this inheritance that Peter is telling us about, he says, well, first of all, it's imperishable. Yeah, nobody can mess around with it. It's not, going to, it's not going to deteriorate. Not only that, it is undefiled. It's perfect. It will not fade away. And it is reserved in heaven. And the very best part of that verse is for you. Very personal. This inheritance is for you. This inheritance is for you. This inheritance is for all of you. All who are children of God. Something that is so much far better than $63 million because there's a big if there and there's other properties around ours that they might decide to just build that complex on those properties. And my girls would be back to $46,550. Now, that's not bad, but that goes in a hurry in today's economy. But this should make us happy. This is a wonderful, wonderful inheritance, and here's the best part of it all, folks. We're happy because we are protected by God. We're protected by God. This inheritance that is reserved in heaven for us means that we have to remain faithful today. We have to travel that, that, that very narrow and straight way that leads to eternal life. We have to be very, very careful about ourselves so that we don't fall away from God. And yet God says, you know what? I'm with you. I'll help you with that. No temptation is, is, is uh, we face without God being there for us. He says, there is no temptation that I will not give you the ability to bear that. We can stand up to Satan every single time and be victorious. And God says, you know what? I'll be with you to the point that we can join Paul in saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can put on the armor of God and I can stand in the strength of his son, Jesus Christ, and I can be successful. And God says, all of that wonderful inheritance, I'm going to help you make sure that you get it because we're protected by God. I'd like for you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 and look with me very quickly at the last two verses, verses 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice, Peter says, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. One of the things we don't talk about very much is that when Jesus comes again, we're going to be in the marvelous presence of God. But guess what? We too are going to be glorified. We too are going to enjoy having glory ourselves as saved children of God. And then in that we greatly rejoice, says Peter. At least we should be. This evening, I hope that you can walk out of this building feeling really good, feeling joyful, knowing that God has saved you through his mercy. He has changed you into a saint and that we have all these wonderful blessings of God and that makes you happy. If you're not a child of God, 
I hope this lesson has made you want to become one. I hope that this lesson has made you realize that like I several years ago <clears throat> realized I was a sinner and I needed to be saved. And if you would be saved this evening, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, if you will let God change your heart in repentance, if you're willing to confess Jesus as the Son of God and your Lord and Savior, and then be baptized with him in water that he might wash you and cleanse you of your sins. If you would do that this evening, we would encourage you by singing this song as we stand.